Good morning. Welcome, this is fantastic uh, to see everybody here. Uh, welcome to the U.S. Institute of Peace. Uh, welcome to the month of March, uh, which as you know is National Women's History Month. Uh, so there are a lot of exciting things happening this month uh, here at the Institute. We're gonna get a chance to talk about them today. Uh, and of course, uh, we are with March 1st, the beginning of lots of interesting, crazy weather. It'll be beautiful today. It will snow on Friday. <laughs> so there's gonna be a mixture of great ideas here and a mixture of really crazy weather out there. Uh, my name is Joe Hewitt. I'm the vice president for the Center for Policy, Learning, and Strategy. Uh, and uh, my job here is to lead a phenomenal team, uh, one person of which is Kathleen Keenest, who I'll introduce in a second. Uh, our job is to take all the evidence and learning that we get from our work here at USIP and use it for better policy engagement and better strategy, all with the goal of making our peace building programs more effective. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about USIP if you're new to the place. Uh, USIP was founded in 1984 uh, by Congress as an independent national institute dedicated to the proposition that peace is possible, practical and essential for US and global security. Uh, we pursue this vision of a world without violent conflict by working on the ground with local partners. We provide people, organizations, and governments with the tools, knowledge, and training to manage conflict so it doesn't become violent and resolve it when it does. In these ways, USIP makes peace possible. Uh, my team works, as I said, to capture and organize the evidence from all of our work to make our peace building programs more effective. We know from years and years of work that peace is not possible without the full and meaningful participation of women in conflict prevention, resolution, and peace building. Uh, often our first expectation when we think about the role of women in conflict-affected environments is to think of them first as peace builders. Uh, that expectation may be shaped by experiences, for example, with the role of women in ending the civil war in Liberia. Uh, and so in some cases, it's an expectation that's warranted. Uh, but however, we often overlook the multiple roles that women already do play in conflict, even as combatants. And that's what we're here today to talk about. Uh, and I'll, if, if I could, I'll share uh, an example of a blind spot that I personally had as a conflict analyst thinking about the role of women in conflict uh, from some work I did in South Sudan. Uh, before I came to USIP, which was in September of this year, uh, I used to work at USAID as a senior conflict advisor. And in the fall of 2012, I was in South Sudan with a team doing a conflict assessment. And we were trying to figure out, uh, this was before all the violence started in December 2013. We were trying to figure out what was going on lately with conflict dynamics there to try to do more work and development that could hopefully address those dynamics. One of the things that we were concerned about at that time, there were a lot of things we were concerned about at that time, was a spike in cattle raiding uh, that was going on mostly in Jungle State in South Sudan. And we were trying to understand why that was happening. Uh, part of the reason had to do with recent inflation in the price of a dowry. Uh, dowry traditionally had been about 30 cows before that, and it had tripled in a short amount of time to be about 80 or 90. That was driving incentives for increased cattle raiding. And cattle raiding was getting more and more violent. And so you had more abductions happening, there was sexual violence, a lot of killing associated with cattle raiding, which was not the norm in South Sudan. So we were trying to figure out what was going on. And one of the questions that my team wanted to address was, well, what could the role of women be in this? And helping to de-escalate these pressures to help reduce the amount of violence that was happening in this practice, what could they do to be helpful? And that was the wrong question. 
uh, we were, we totally had blind spots on because uh, in fact, women were encouraging the cattle raiding. Uh, mothers and grandmothers were the ones who were setting the higher and higher prices on the dowry, and then encouraging boys and young men to engage in the cattle raiding to build up the supply of cows in their own communities. Uh, and so we really had a blind spot to uh, the way to do this analysis. We quickly, I, I hope, I like to think, we addressed that and we started to think of uh, more effective ways to design programs to deal with that problem. Events took a turn in South Sudan, of course, and lots of other things overwhelmed that particular case. But it's an example of how if you go into a conflict environment thinking that women are only peace builders, you potentially have this, this blind spot that will make your analysis of the situation incomplete. So today, USIP begins a month-long series of events in celebration of National Women's History Month. Uh, USIP will take the time to reflect and learn from not only our work, but that of scholars and practitioners around the world. We'll have the opportunity to have multiple events in the building over the course of the month. We're going to have a rich exchange of ideas about the role of women, but generally about the relationship between gender roles and conflict. Uh, and I think by the end of the month, we are going to have a tremendous set of experiences uh, to help us better understand this work. So I'm delighted that we're starting today with such a great uh, audience here. So many people came out, leaving your busy schedules to join us today. So I'm really delighted. Uh, so I'd like to introduce Kathleen Keenest, who is the director of our gender policy and strategy team uh, in the Center for uh, Policy Learning and Strategy. Uh, she has been here at USIP for nine years, more than nine years. And she leads our efforts to integrate gender into everything that we do. Uh, it was her idea when our center was being established to make sure that gender was part of the center, recognizing that in everything the Institute does, gender has a role in, under, in, in helping us to understand conflict. Uh, the causes and consequences of conflict are experienced and understood differently by gender, by across different gender groups. And if we don't institutionalize that in the work that we do, our work is gonna be less effective. And so it's a great pleasure uh, to introduce Kathleen to you. Um, please join me in welcoming Kathleen Keenest. Thank you. Thanks very much, Joe, and good morning to everyone. Uh, let our last guest here get settled. So this event has really been in my sights for the last eight years when I first began my work here uh, on gender. And I'm concerned that then as today that too often our stereotypical uh, portrayal of women as peaceful and men as violent harkens to our age-old tendency to divide the world into simple binaries. Masculine, feminine, protector, protected, combatant, caregiver, perpetrator, victim, war, peace. And this oversimplification of gender stereotypes, uh, we actually fail to understand then the complex gender relationships that actually socializes violence into our everyday lives. And thus, our interventions to end violence often lack nuance and the test of reality, as Joe gave such a great example. Therefore, our event this morning is attempt to move beyond our reliance on stereotypical frameworks that limit our ability to analyze the multiple roles and agencies that we all have regardless of our gender. You may ask why this is important to our work in peace building. Our gender work at USIP is about making the invisible visible. A foundational part of our work is the UN Security Council Resolution 1325, which launched the field of women, peace, and security, and continues to move women from their invisible role in war and peace to one that is visible, from being counted as victims of war, but also counted as pivotal partners in peace building. So, 
Let us begin here. Uh, as uh, the morning will proceed, you will hear from three experts whose research reveals that violence is not exclusive male bastion and that women are not always peaceful. I've asked the <coughs> panelists here today to give brief and succinct overviews of their research, so we'll have time to really discuss it with you, our audience. And um, now I'm going to switch roles and sit down, switch mics, and begin. So um, I'm going to introduce each of the panelists. Uh, you also have their bios, so if you want more information about them. Um, our first panelist is Wendy Lauer, and she is the John K. Roth Professor of History at Claremont McKenna College, and is also now uh, at the Holocaust Museum, where she is the acting director of the Jack, Joseph, and Morton Mandel Center for Advanced Holocaust Studies. I first came across her work when my neighbor presented her book to me. And she, he said, I, I think you really need to read this book. I, I think this is something you should know about. And it is called Hitler's Furies, German Women in the Nazi Killing Fields. Uh, it really intrigued me. Of course, I did read it. Uh, and I'm thrilled that Wendy will be with us today to tell us more about her research. Uh, I will add that Something that I think we need more in our women, peace, and security work is the, the view of history, and Wendy will bring that celebration of Women's History Month to us all here. Thank you. Our second panelist is Hamoun Kelgat Dust. He is a PhD scholar at the Department of Political Science at the National University of Singapore. A long ways to come. Yay. He was also here for the ISA conference, so we were it's able to. Uh, pleasure is mine. Thank you. Thanks to good friends here. Uh, he is in his final year as a PhD candidate, where he is looking at gender dynamics within jihadi organizations focused on the relationship between between jihadi's uh, view on state building and the roles women are assigned to in these organizations. So he'll give us a much <coughs> deeper dive on these issues. And our third panelist is my colleague here at the U.S. Institute of Peace, uh, Belkis Ahmadi, who is a senior program officer in our Asia Center. Belkis brings years of experience working in Afghanistan on issues related to gender, human rights, and civil society development. Most recently, and I hope you picked up her report out at the desk, uh, she and her colleague uh, wrote a report and actually commissioned a study looking at the role of women uh, in the Taliban organization. So she will be drawing from that <coughs> research. So I want to begin and ask Wendy uh, if you want to take the podium sure. or here, either I one is okay. works. Right. And uh, please uh, welcome Wendy Lauer. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you, Joe. It's a real pleasure to be here at the U.S. Institute of Peace, and it's just lovely to be in this marvelous building by Moshe Safdie, who, by the way, was the architect of Yad Vashem in Jerusalem, a place that I've, as a Holocaust scholar, I've spent a lot of time at that location as well. So thank you very much. Um, I am providing, hopefully, today some sort of historical perspective, um, maybe open up some of the themes that will resonate into contemporary events. As Mark Twain allegedly said, he's allegedly said a lot of things. Um, history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. Um, I, as I got into my research on perpetrators of the Holocaust, and I've been at it for, for a couple of decades, um, I started to see my own blind spot uh, in the literature. Um, and it came to light to me by looking at the sources, by going down to the ground level and keeping my eyes open to what I was seeing in, those do in the documentation that I uncovered in Ukraine after the collapse of the Soviet Union. <clears throat> But it was really driven by underlying questions of how and why women become involved in extremist movements, specifically in the history of the rise of political movements in the last century and the interwar period of fascism, Stalinist, um, Soviet communism, Bolshevism in Europe. Now, my research focuses on the Holocaust and the role of German women who joined racist, nationalist, anti-Semitic movements of the time. 
But we assume with our gendered bias that women are nurturers, sources of progressive, peaceful values and of empathetic behavior. But something went terribly wrong. Yet the history shows us in the Holocaust that genocide is women's business too. Now, when I first went to the archives um, in Ukraine, um, and again, this on the ground view, which I want to stress not only trying to open our eyes to uh, behavior of women, uh, uh, women in their involvement in political movements, extremist movements, so many things that kind of contradict what we think of, as well as break down those bin binaries, as Kathleen um, described them. Um, it, it took a while for this to sink in for me. First of all, the literature was not only my own bias, but it was the weight of the historiography, the literature on the Holocaust um, that kind of, in a way, prevented me from seeing certain things. Um, the role of women in the Holocaust had been predominantly focused on caricatures of camp guards in uniform, um, which, as one historian, Claudia Kuntz, observed, sensationalized Nazism by locating evil in eroticized women. So concepts of, of female violence were really rooted in these kind of pornographic, sexualized um, portraits of women. That was one hurdle I kind of had to overcome. The other one was that they were in the system, the machinery of destruction, and formally trained in uniform. And I was out in Ukraine and doing work on archives in Belarus and in the Baltics, and this is not, if you know your history of the Holocaust, most of the crimes that occurred um, outside the camp system, outside the killing centers of Poland, in the so-called killing fields, about almost half the victims were killed in open air, kind of mass shootings, um, in the kind of killing fields that we think of in other cases of genocide. So I had to bring, my, in my own thinking and in the documentation, brought me there, bring women out of these kind of enclosed domestic settings and into these sites of violence, these kind of open air, uh, broad daylight, uh, the Holocaust by bullets, as, as one of my colleagues calls it. Um, the other issue I had to overcome was the weight of the propaganda literature um, of Nazi Germany, that we see these visualizations that Goebbels, the propaganda ministry, was projecting the kind of wish fulfillment of the regime, which was the very, you know, the pure Aryan woman who, again, was, was a baby machine for the Fuhrer and was only valued for her reproductive ability. In the literature on the Holocaust, the perpetrator portraits, meanwhile, so there was literature on women in Nazi Germany and where their uh, agency was or lack thereof as a mis in a misogynist kind of pa patriarchal system. And then the literature on Holocaust perpetration was moving in another direction in which all these portraits of male killers was becoming increasingly nuanced from, um, you know, of course, there were the biographies of Hitler um, and Himmler, um, but as we moved down and looked at our understand genocide as a social phenomenon, a collective experience of an entire society mobilizing, campaigning against, perpetrating um, uh, mass atrocities against uh, a vulnerable minority. Um, those portraits of men became ever more complicated. We had the uh, technocrats in the kind of machinery of destruction who could be engineers, who could be doctors, who could be professionals. We had the so-called desk murderers, those like Eichmann in Berlin who were signing orders and weren't necessarily getting their hands bloody, but actually pushing through um, a system of mass murder. We had the ordinary men who were in police uniforms that my colleague worked on, who were sent out into the field, who were regular traffic cops, and suddenly they were out and they were organized into these uh, mobile uh, police units. Um, we had the uh, voracious plunderers, the, the, the role of greed, the role of um, sadism, the habitual killer, the role of peer pressure. Uh, it, it became the study of evil and cruelty that men were perpetrating became incredibly um, uh, complex, and yet women were not part of that discussion. Did it make sense to study evil and cruelty as a gendered phenomenon? If we presume a female nature of innocence, do we end up removing women from the history of genocide? And losing sight of genocide is a female problem of behavior that applies to men as well as women. Historian Ann Taylor Allen, I think, summed it up nicely, and I'm quoting her. Women, while they remain in the female sphere, are thus endowed with innocence of the crimes of the modern state, but at the price of being placed outside of modernity and indeed outside of history itself. 
in the Nazi um, case of, of female perpetration, as I started to look at it more closely, I started to also appreciate that these were women who came of age dur during a certain period of time. And when I looked at the records of women who were involved um, in these atrocities, in the killing fields, in all kinds of um, support functions, but also some who became killers. So there were something like, mm, oh, about 3,600 camp guards, um, and then, um, uh, so that was one set of, of violent women who were trained to be violent, and then there was this whole population that were mobilized for the war and sent to the Eastern territories in a kind of missionary, they were self-identifying as revolutionaries, as missionaries, as patriots, who were going to be part of a bigger war effort, a half a million nurses, secretaries who were working in these field offices. Um, uh, auxiliaries in the uh, SS police offices, in Wehrmacht, in the army support offices, teachers. This was not just a campaign of war uh, when the Nazis went to the Eastern territories. If you know your history, they wanted to create this colonial empire, this Lebensraum, as they called it, and that would then involve a whole range of activities of, of welfare workers, of teachers, of you know building schools, and they wanted to create a whole new society. And of course, so the women fit into that um, uh, effort, that bigger imperial effort and they went there with ambitions and dreams and they were seeking you know uh, social mobility uh, existed in these in these um, uh, uh, at the edge of, uh, of the empires or in these um, outposts. So I started to eventually place women, ordinary German women, on the map outside of Germany of where a lot of these crimes occurred in Poland and the Baltics and Ukraine and Belarus. As many as a half a million kind of circulating in these, um, in these regions. And so proximity became a very important part of the story, that there was no argument to be made that they didn't know what was going on. There was no argument to be made that they were back in the Reich tending to the home front. So that old notion of women during war being at the home front, that started to break down. Now they're actually part of an imperial kind of genocidal uh, form of war. And so when I looked at the women who went, I noticed that most of them were born, they were single and they were born like right after the First World War, 1920, 1921. And so suddenly I started to see this was a generational um, phenomenon and that they had been socialized, it was a cohort during a particular time. And I call them the kind of lost generation of post-World War I baby boomers. And they had a common experience in the, Hitler, in the, in the school systems in the 1930s when and this fascist, this Hitler regime was really starting to take root in the school system. They had, on the one hand, been exposed to the excitement of gaining the vote. The suffragists had, you know, had were victorious the, in Germany as well as in the U.S. and the Soviet Union. So suddenly, women were part of a political process. They were going to the voting booths. They were activated. Um, where would they go? In what direction would they go with that new power of uh, of the ballot? And in this case, they were um, socialized during the dictatorship and the. 30s, and there was this interesting mix of what we think of as a kind of new woman of Weimar Germany, kind of gone wrong, you know, but then kind of that sense of liberation and excitement and involvement um, and breaking out, as it were, is then kind of um, uh, uh, channeled in um, through the, the Reich, through this fascist regime in the 1930s uh, with the dismantling of the democracy. And all of the um, uh, images of, of women in Third Reich, um, when you get down to the sources and drill down into what's going on, on the ground, none of that holds up, right? So after 1935, the birth rate was declining in Germany and the divorce rate was increasing, and statistics show that most German women were not married, were not constantly pregnant, and not staying at home. As full-fledged members of Hitler's fascist society, they were political despite themselves. In fact, the woman question was not shelved but refashioned in the Nazi era. The private became political. The tentacles of the movement reached into the home and pulled women and girls out to the streets in public rallies and parades to labor assignments on farms, gatherings in summer camps, marching exercises, domestic science courses, flag-raising ceremonies, and the like. When I spoke to some of the women from the time, I conduct a lot of oral history interviews with them, those I could find, or reading the memoir literature, I was struck by a common theme that came up, which sounds kind of like a cliche now, but many of them said, you know, I really wanted to make something of my life. Um, I wanted to become somebody, this kind of notion of self-actualization, and I think it's important to see how individuals 
men and women, how these movements, um, for better or worse, the political activism of this, a sense of belonging to a revolution and in realizing oneself through that revolution um, and being bound by a certain shared conviction, political, ideological, religious conviction, how appealing that is um, uh, to women as well as men. And now in my um, uh, uh, book, I ended up focusing on 13 biographies. I couldn't deal with the whole complex of a half a million women, so I really zeroed in on 13 biographies that I thought were representative of this um, phenom phenomenon of kind of ordinary German women being mobilized um, to uh, participate in the Nazi war of destruction, and in very some cases actually take to, to uh, perpetrate um, on their own the killing of of Jewish children, and it's one of the things that I noticed that was uh, rather alarming, a lot of this is overcoming certain, again, bias, and you're kind of shocked, and then you pull back, and you say, okay, wait a minute, this is actually happening, um, that the many of the women who did kill outside of the camp system, so took took the, you know, the ideas, internalized the ideas of the regime, and um, on their own, without following orders, uh, they didn't have that defense um, and, and got involved in the killing, often targeted children. And it's just interesting dynamic of, or reality of women who um, perpetrate um, uh, against the most vulnerable population, in this case, a Jewish population, and then within that population, children specifically. And doing this with their um, their husbands. Um, and it, it may just struck me, this the whole family structure as well, both on the part of the perpetrators as well as um, the victims, how that's part of this um, reality, again, in, in these uh, social settings. One of the women who was responsible in that, who committed these crimes, Erna Petrie, who's featured in the book, um, when she was interrogated by the Stasi in 1961 and pressed, and she confessed to, to killing Jewish children and asked, you know, why could you, how could you do this? You yourself were, you were a woman, you were a mother. And she said, I wanted to um, uh, uh, live up to the men around me. I wanted to prove myself to the men around me. And she also stated that she had been um, indoctrinated, basically uh, socialized in a way that she was taught to, to hate Jews and, um, and Jewish children. There was no, no exception. How do we make sense of the cruelty and extreme violence of ordinary German men and women in the Nazi era? In my book, I explore explanations. Um, there are quite a few out there, including from primatologists, and we can go back deeper, to <coughs> Sigmund Freud and Cesar Lombroso. But actually, James Waller's work, I thought, was the most interesting, a social psychologist. He's up at Keene State, and he stresses in his book that, of course, all men and women have the potential to commit evil acts, but it is our environment and social conditioning that brings out this capability, and it is a minority. Most of the killers of, in perpetrators in the Holocaust were men, let me be clear about that. Um, it is a minority who go to the extreme of killing. And when I interviewed some of the prosecutors who uh, were involved in cases against the women featured in my book, um, they stressed that in, in the post-war era, they did not encounter anyone who could be described as psychopathic. Uh, one stated to me the individuals were not insane, it was the Nazi system that was crazy. Um, that the point here being that many of the individuals we look at who perpetrate these crimes in different contexts are normal law, peace-loving, law-abiding citizens. They're not um, serial killers, habitual killers once this system collapses and is um, discredited or they're pulled out of that um, environment. In many ways, my research is, um, Hiller's Furies, the, 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 the culmination of my research published, is about how we fail to reckon with the past, not so much as an historical restruction, reconstruction or morality tale, but as evidence of a recurring problem in which we all share responsibility. What are the blind spots and taboos that persist in our retelling of events and in our national histories? And why does the history of the Holocaust, and specifically these kinds of um, um, deep violations of what we think of, of our values, of our perceptions of female behavior. Why is that so difficult to, um, to uh, study and understand, and in some cases actually accept? 
The consensus in Holocaust and genocide studies is that the systems that make mass murder possible would not function without the broad participation of society. Ne nearly all histories of the Holocaust leave out half of those who populate that society, as if women's history happens somewhere else. It is an illogical approach and it's a puzzling omission. The dramatic stories of ordinary German women in the Nazi era reveal the darkest side of female activism, and they show us what can happen when women are mobilized for war and acquiesce in genocide. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Hamoun? I don't know if you want to take the podium or. Uh, no, I would be sitting here because okay. I did this. I'm sorry, well, I didn't Absolutely, know my idea, yeah, right? no, that's Thank perfect. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's just a pleasure to be here. Um, I have actually prepared a few slides here, if you want to have a look at that. I thought maybe it would make my uh, presentation a bit more clear. Uh, well, the thing that I'm going to talk about today is a part of the story that might be not heard that much, and um, it is very much in line with what uh, Wendy was talking about. It is about um, a, a certain amount of certain uh, class of women, certain group of women who are participating in the atrocity of groups such as uh, some of the GRU organizations, such as ISIS, both directly and indirectly. So, by that one, I'm going to take you through these slides here. Um, if we look at the statistics that we have now, it is clear that the women's incorporation into jihadi organizations is on rise. And at the same time, um, if we look closer at the whole story, we can see that this um, increase is not only in terms of numbers of these women, but also the roles that they are accepting in these jihadi organizations as well. And if we actually go closer to what uh, statistics and research show us, we can see that the increase in women's incorporation into jihadi organizations is not proportionately distributed as well, both, again, in terms of numbers and roles. What does it mean? It means that some jihadi organizations are more inclusive of women, and some of them are more exclusive of them. And that is actually fine, I mean, uh, laying the foundation of my research on understanding why is women's incorporation is on rise anyway in general, and why this distribution is disproportionate? It means that some more, some some GRU organizations are more inclusive and some of them are less, and how it works. Well. Um, to answer those questions, actually, um, I am presenting you the findings of my research, which I have spent about two years on field for collecting data for that in Afghanistan, in Iraq, borders of Syria, southern part of Turkey, and Lebanon. Um, and with that one, um, I came up with a typology of jihadi organization, which I guess can, which I believe, actually, I, it can explain this proportion, disproportionate distribution of women in these organizations both in terms of num numbers and uh, roles. And this typology includes operation-based jihadi organizations and state-building jihadi organizations. Operation-based jihadi organizations are those whom we are really, whom we are more um, familiar with, you know, those terrorist organizations, quote-unquote, Al-Qaeda, Haggani Network, and others. And state-building jihadi organizations are those organizations which are seeking or they have the aspiration of creating a state, a caliphate, something like IS or ISIS of yesterday, or groups like um, Jafat Fatou Sham or others. With that category, I argue that state-building jihadi organizations provide a more favorable environment for women to incorporate into their system. It might be a bit strange because what we hear about ISIS or groups like ISIS is nothing but atrocity of them towards women, which is absolutely a, a, a fact, it cannot be denied. But in this research, I am trying to say that there are a specific number of women, just like what uh, <clears throat> Wendy was talking about, that they are involved in this system and they are contributing directly and indirectly towards the atrocity of the system and to even run the whole system in, in general. So to 
have an understanding of what we are roughly talking about, if we look at operation-based jihadi organization, we are talking about groups like Al-Qaeda, Jima Islamia, Haqqani Network, Lashkar Tayyib, and so on and so forth. And these groups are what we call uh, like hit and run. They just make an, make an attack and retrieve. They don't hold population, they don't hold territory, they don't have any specific place that we can locate them. So this is the kind of groups that we call them operation-based groups. And on the other hand, we have the state-building groups, like um, Islamic State as the flagship of that. IS franchises around in, in Libya, in, in, uh, in Nigeria, and other places, Jabhat Fatou Sham or, or Jash al Fat, which are mostly working in, uh, or, or they have their territories in um, Syria, Idlib area. It's also important to know that the state building jihadi organizations are only able of um, um, operating in weak or failed states. So being a weak or a failed state provides a favorable environment for these groups to operate. So in these groups, in these uh, states, um, these groups are trying to demonstrate themselves or to portray themselves as, an, as a functioning alternative to the already failed or weak state. And to do so, they have to fill three gaps. And these gaps are gaps that I argue women are utilized by these organizations in order to make themselves a functioning state. One is the security, secondly is the service and public good provision, and thirdly is the legitimacy. Women are important for these groups to fill up these gaps, and women contribute positively to fill these gaps for these groups. And these gaps are gaps that operation-based jihadi organizations do not face, because they are just hit and run. They are not going to, to make themselves an alternative, a functional alternative to the state, to the weak or failed state that they are um, functioning in those territories. Look at this diagram here. Um, these are very, it's a very rough idea of how women contribute and how women are being utilized by these groups in terms of providing legitimacy, service provision, and security. For example, I mean, I'm going towards, uh, I'm going to explain them in, in further detail, but women are utilized extensively in compared with jihadi, uh, in compared with the operation-based jihadi organizations in terms of, for example, if you start from the middle one, the service provision, uh, women are utilized by these groups as teachers, educators, doctors, nurses, tax collectors, housing and sheltering officers, and many other roles that we can talk about that in further detail a bit later. In terms of security, women are uh, incorporated into military divisions of ISIS or Jabhat Fatou Sham, and also in the police force, which is uh, the Al Khansa uh, Brigade, which is, um, I guess, that's the most famous one when it comes to the matter of women's involvement and incorporation into ISIS. And in terms of legitimacy, women are, um, just let me put this one at that, with me. Uh, sorry. Uh, in terms of legitimacy, there are three levels that I'm going to talk to about them in detail, in further detail a bit later. Um, by making hijra, which is a migration to these group, to, to the territory of these groups, by the whole concept of motherhood and family, and being advocator and recruiter for these groups. And one thing that's very important about these groups is the mechanism by which these groups incorporate women. I call them gender segregated parallel institutions. It means that if you have a sector of, if you have an institution, whatever institution of a state you have, healthcare system, uh, finance system, education system, and so, forth, so on and so forth, a, a specific part of these institutions would be designated for women only, run by women, and to address women's affairs. That is the way that they do the things. So inter intermixing between sexes would be reduced as much as possible, and women are in charge of women's affairs there. And that is the way that they are being incorporated in different aspects of the state um, approaches. Mm -hmm. And this is, as I said, again, going back to the whole notion of the story, uh, is to reduce intermixing. Intermixing of sexes is one thing that these groups are looking at when it comes to the women issue as the source of all the evils, the source of all the problems that they have. By reducing that, by separating them, uh, you will be able of utilizing them in a way that ideologically, religiously justifiable. And that is something that these groups use. To go a bit further, um, look at the kind of illegitimacy that, for example, these women can provide. 
legitimacy, if you look at that, for example, the organizational legitimacy theory, uh, there are four steps in this, uh, uh, in this theory. One is the establishment of the, uh, of the legitimacy. Secondly is the maintaining of that, expansion of that, and defending of the legitimacy in case of troubles and problems. In terms of establishing legitimacy, groups like ISIS, are emphasizing on this whole concept of hijra, migration to these, to, the, to their land, to their territories, to, to, to their territories, to their um, uh, so-called caliphates. In countries or in states or in caliphate, as you call them, where we don't have popular political participation, like voting, um, uh, going to, to, uh, to make petitions and things like that, with in absence of such mechanisms, making and um, an, an informed decision of leaving your home country, taking all the troubles to come to the state that ISIS has established there, is giving a sense of legitimacy, establishing a sense of legitimacy in terms of a popular support. We have women coming from all around the world, saying bye to their families, saying bye to their home countries, and coming to, to ISIS territory. ISIS uses these women as a show of legitimacy among its population, specifically women. And that goes, again, if you want to look at that, it goes against what we call women's in emancipation by, women, uh, by, by the Western societies or secular societies. ISIS is saying, look, women who are supposedly being emancipated by you are saying bye to whatever you are saying and coming to us. And against the concept of emancipation, Western emancipation, ISIS is offering them something else, which I call it uh, divine redemption. That is one thing that ICE is calling it as an ideological uh, rivalry to, to, to what uh, emancipation of women by West is. I can discuss that later on if, if you would like to, to know more about that. In terms of maintenance, when they are coming to the state, when not only the migrant people, but the Iraqis and Syrians that are living in those countries, in, in, the, in the caliphate territory of, of ISIS, motherhood and family plays a very important role in maintaining the population, in creating a new generation of jihadis, both men and women, and therefore motherhood, which is very, very respected in the Islamic ideology as well, plays a very important role for groups like ISIS. So they are emphasizing on the role of women as mothers, and not only uh, biological producers, but informed mothers. If you look at, for example, the propaganda, or when I was talking to many of these women who have escaped ISIS territories, ISIS actually provide free education, <coughs> education uh, for, for, for women, for mothers, for uh, uh, young women, and this is ideological education for them. So they want a kind of, not only biological producers, but informed biological producers. So they would be the one uh, passing the heritage of, the ideological heritage of ISIS to the next generation. So informed mothers would be the ones that they can pass this uh, heritage to their children children in a way, um, uh, appropriate way. In terms of expanding their, their, their legitimacy, advocates of ISIS, online advocates of them, or face-to-face or -face advocacy and recruiters of, of ISIS play a very significant role. It is very easy to go to any online platform that you have and type something like, I like jihad, I like to migrate. It would be just a matter of few minutes for uh, ISIS recruiter or, or ISIS uh, uh, advocates to contact you and to offer you some more help, offer you what would you like to know. And that what would you like to know would end up planning everything for you, how to actually get to, to how to get out of your country, what kind of things you need, people that you have to meet throughout your process, who is going to greet you in Turkey, who is going to take you all the way to the southern part of Syria, southern part of Turkey to pass you through the, the border. So these are there. And by that, they are, at the same time, by t uh, through these technical issues, technical uh, things of the, um, the trip, they are also, uh, portraying a very idealistic utopian society uh, of, uh, which ISIS have made in, in Syria or Iraq, for example. How wonderful things are, how normal things are there. You are uh, able of accessing to your mobile phones, uh, free education, free housing, free water, electricity, free school for your children. I don't know, um, uh, free cars, uh, if you were not able of, for example, doing anything, as for example, I'm just giving an example, if you are a Muslim woman in France and you are wearing your hijab, your niqab or 
or burqa, and you are not able of even going to, to, to a theater, to a cinema, because by law it's forbidden, ISIS recruiters tell you that, all right, keep that level of religiosity, keep that ideology, keep what you wear, come to us, you will be ahead of a school. You will be, I don't know, uh, you will be working somewhere as the sense of you know, giving them agency. You can be in charge of a police force, you can be a police officer and all this kind of stuff. However, at the same time, we have to understand that the legitimacy of all right, okay, the ISIS legitimacy is very much a performance-based legitimacy. It means that as long as they can perform on, on ground, they would be safe and there would be the legitimacy coming. But when it comes to the matter of today's uh, issues that, for example, they are losing a space, losing things, uh, in that sense, they are turning towards another thing, which I call it the, being the flagship of global jihad. By that, they are bringing women in uh, and use them in, in suicide bombing, in terrorist activities all around the world. And uh, I just go for one more second. And if you look at the service provision story, uh, as you can see, there are women involved in, in as, as teachers, educators, doctors, nurses, but in institutions that they are gender desegregated. Schools are for women, only for girls, and the kids. The, the teachers are girl, uh, women. Same thing goes for for school and other things. And if you look at that, for example, in that picture there at the right side, in the instead enroll now, it's a medical college advertisement by ISIS, which is open to both men and women, but in separate classes. And to finally. Uh, wrap the whole thing. In the military also we have women who are coming there. Uh, they, are, they have been used in the Mosul front that we have now, the fighting going on as suicide bombers. And of course at the police uh, forces, they are the one in charge of uh, maintaining order and observing the uh, enforcement of uh, moral code of ISIS on the streets. And women are torturing women. Women, women are torturing women who are breaking these, co these codes. Women are the one arresting them, interrogating them, putting them in prison, and even um, passing them as sex slaves to, to other agencies of ISIS, which is another complicated uh, department. But uh, yeah, uh, this is how ISIS is actually using women, incorporate them uh, to keep the state running and keep the state functioning. Thank you very much for that. Thank you, Hamoud. I'm sure you have a hundred questions like I do, so. Uh, no <laughs> but we have uh, yet another excellent expert here to talk about Afghanistan and uh, the role of women uh, in the Taliban. Uh, Belkis. Thank you and good morning. <clears throat> uh, women are perfectly capable of mediating peace. Uh, furthering and leading political visions, <coughs> constructing, uh, helping, con uh, help constructing democratic societies based on equality and respect for human dignity. We don't need to prove that. We all know that. And there are, but there is a large body of literature, including evidence-based research, about women's role in, um, uh, and contribution to peace and preventing violent conflict. What needs to be done, as Wendy and Hamoun um, just described, is the need to study more in depth and recognize at both policy and practice the multiple roles that women play and their capability to initiate, participate in, and instigate violence. Generally, I'll be talking about the research that Kathleen just mentioned in Afghanistan. So generally speaking, Afghan women are perceived as non-threatening by uh, security forces as well as locals, making them extremely useful as intelligent collectors and as spies supporting the violent groups, including, including Taliban and other violent extremist groups. The extent to which Afghan women play a role in instigating violent extremism is yet to be studied. In an effort to explore and analyze the multiple roles that Afghan women play um, in both preventing as well as supporting violence, including violent extremism. My co-author, Sadaf Lakani, who is not here today with us, uh, and I conducted a research last year. It was a 
eight to nine months research uh, conducted in five provinces in Afghanistan. Uh, in this research, we looked into women's roles during the Soviet invasion to give it an historic perspective. Uh, in the 80s, um, on how, on what re roles they played, uh, roles they played as promoters of communist values, um, and also in the battlefield, fighting against Soviet soldiers and recruiting for Mujahideen. We also looked in the roles that they played in feeding the Mujahideen, washing their clothes, and helping them, helping them hide in their homes. We interviewed female family members of former and current Taliban fighters. We also talked to Taliban, former Taliban officials and commanders, as well as Mujahideen fighters and commanders. I would like to share some of the key findings of that study with you. So as I said historically, Afghan women have played pivotal roles during the last four decades of um, war as mobilizers, sympathizers, logistics providers, and informants. While women still play a role in support for Taliban and other violent extremist groups today, it's much less direct. And we'll talk about why is it. So in general, we found that older women have greater level of influence on their son's actions, and especially when the mother is the head of the family. And that we learned from both male and female interviewees. However, in most cases, women are kept in the dark uh, by the men in the family about their work outside their homes. Many of the female family members of Taliban that we interviewed said they had no clue that their husbands and sons were with the Taliban. They only found out from neighbors and other villagers or when the family member was injured or killed. And when we asked uh, men for why was that the case, they simply said they could not trust women and also they didn't want to be prevented. Uh, we also came across uh, women who proudly expressed their support for the so-called jihad and regretted that the cultural restrictions prevented them from taking active role in uh, the ongoing war which they saw as legitimate cause. There are also women who actually believe that the men in the family are doing God's work because they are being told so by the men in the family as well as the mullahs. For this category of women, we found that their main source of information was their male family members or the um, mosque's loudspeakers, to which a significant number of mullahs glorify jihad and other politically motivated religious ideologies. We found that the narrative by violent extremism, uh, extremist group, uh, groups is powerful at so many different levels, and they resonate with ordinary Afghans who have little knowledge of religious teachings. As you know, many Afghans, 99% uh, of the Afghan population is Muslim, and many Afghans are able to recite the Quran. They can read the Quran. <laughs> Almost the entire Muslim population say their five-time prayers in Arabic with little knowledge of the language and the meanings. So what do they do? They look up to mullahs and other recognized or self-proclaimed religious scholars for guidance and interpretation of religious uh, texts. This has given the religious actors a great level of influence and authority over the entire population. In most cases, mullahs choose what interpretation to use when explaining verses of the Quran or a hadith. In most cases, their interpretation is out of context or simply unsubstantiated. Uh, some of the examples that was narrated by the interviewees um, was interesting, and I would like to mention two of them here. One was that the mullahs talk about how at night, 
the grave of a martyr is illuminated with colorful lights, which can only be seen by faithful and sinless Muslims, and by mothers who send off their sons to jihad. Or another is when a man is martyred for Allah's cause and for defending his religion, he will be rewarded to facilitate the entry of up to 70 members of his family to paradise. And this is unfortunately publicly propagated <coughs> by mullahs to loudspeakers. A large number of men, women, and youth believe this rhetoric and are willing to die for. So the reward of paradise is also a lure for women. Women are told that if they support and encourage their sons to fight for their religion, um, they too will be rewarded. Conversely, if they prevent their sons and their husbands from joining the jihad, the so-called jihad, they are in fact preventing them from fulfilling their duty deemed by God and destroying their own chance at entering paradise. So in conclusion, women, as it was said before, uh, perform multiple roles that need to be recognized at practice and policy level. <coughs> if not, we will fail in uh, preventing and count countering um, these um, acts. Women perform certain uh, functions that are critical to violent extremist groups because in a place like Afghanistan, which I'm sure is the case in other uh, Muslim countries as well, security procedures for women are often more lax than for men. Uh, women, in many cases, reinforce values and beliefs that are central to radicalizing others. Uh, I want to repeat that again, that women's potential to prevent violent extremism needs to be recognized and considered in CVE and also PVE uh, programming. Thank you. Thank you, Belkis. up in a minute or so to uh, questions and answers, uh, so begin thinking about that, because we want to hear from you. But I, I want to just uh, begin the discussion, because it is uh, National Women's History Month. Um, each of you brought in some thread of history and the role of history in shaping the decisions of young people, in, in this case young women, to engage in extremist uh, movements, ideologies, and activities. Um, it seems like that's a gap in a lot of the policy work we do here within Washington is to reflect back on the historical predicament and what that does to motivate uh, young people. And I'd like you to just take another minute to think about the role of history here, and and really because a lot of this audience has policy makers, or at least policy shapers uh, here, what, what are we missing here and what do we need to bring to our our current understanding of violent extremism. Wendy, I'm going to start with you. Sure. I mean, I think we saw in these cases how important um, the cultural context, the, the very particularities of cases, how much that matters, because there were differences, clearly, um, as well as similarities, and the issue of roles was important. But I, I guess what one could observe more generally is that these are women who see themselves as part of history, whether through a kind of religious lens or a revolutionary kind of secular lens, um, but identify in different ways, identify in their roles in a particular way, but also see themselves as something bigger um, uh, within their community, and that it has an historical trajectory, and they're part of that, um, you know, and it might even be an historical sense or a kind of teleological sense that has a paradise, you know, that's non-secular, right? Mm -hmm. but they do see themselves in this bigger kind of movement or stream of, of history and um, and then maybe go to the next level and take a role, take a position um, um, and perform in some way either very with, with very strong convictions or even kind of ritualistically as you were saying that they um, uh, 
join forces with that movement and find their place in it. And, you know, in genocide studies, we talk about um, uh, roles to, to the extent that, you know, small tasks can have huge impacts. And not to think of the, the ways that those who, uh, you know, being a cog in the wheel is a kind of self-defense. <laughs> We've been, you know, uh, kind of brainwashed in that regard as well. And, that, and understanding how the, um, the sum of the parts, you know, that ultimately the impact of a regime in terms of violence and violence extremism and its spread really can be broken down into these very discrete roles um, that men and, and women play self-consciously. Right. Uh, well, I guess uh, history plays a very important role in terms of uh, making proper policies to address the issues that we have. For example, what we were hearing from Wendy uh, when we are talking about the story of Holocaust or the story of women, uh, Nazi women in World War II, we can see some, a lot of similarities between what has happened then and what is happening now, for example, in groups like ISIS. That is something that we always miss because uh, groups like ISIS or jihadi groups like that, because of the media, because of all those coverage that we think that they are getting, um, they are portraying themselves as something extraordinarily different, something absolutely new, something that we have never heard about them, a group of group, I mean, call them jihadi organization coming, taking care of it, taking over of a, a territory and calling themselves a state. And we think that, oh my goodness, I mean, nothing has, like this has happened before. But if it, I mean, look back and see um, groups, you know, ideologically um, motivated groups like Nazis or, or other groups, uh, even if you look at, for example, the concepts, uh, situations like in Nicaragua, in, in, um, in China, in, in um, Vietnam, for example, uh, there are so many of these uh, similarities between these groups. I mean, the way that they exclude women in some parts of the, the battle and then they include them again. So I guess looking at history and looking at how women were operating within these organizations can help us way more in understanding how the mechanism, the internal mechanism of these groups, jihadi organizations, or the threats that we are going to face in future would play. And I guess that's one thing that we miss a lot in that sense. That's great. Thank you. Uh, this was so much a part of your story in your special report, uh, Belkis, about uh, the period of the Sovietization process and, and women, Afghan women, reacting to that. Can you reflect on that issue? Sure. Well, First of all, I think history does play a very important role in understanding the role that women play today in participating as well as in uh, contributing to violence and more specifically in um, violent extremism. But I would also add to like that gender roles in a society, a historic um, review of how gender roles have evolved over time and how has that played a positive and negative role in women's decision to join or to sympathize and instigate violence needs to be studied. What we studied in Afghanistan was that during the Soviet invasion, uh, in the minds of many Afghans, um, Soviet uh, troops were seen as invaders who had invaded a Muslim uh, sovereign society. So both men and women thought it was their national duty and religious duty to take part in so many different ways to um, fight against uh, invaders. So the question we asked was, we basically wanted to know how jihad was perceived and interpreted in those days, in the 80s, because many people still call the ongoing war in Afghanistan as a legitimate jihad. We were surprised that when we talked about, when we deconstructed the concept of jihad, many women did not agree with uh, seeing this ongoing war as jihad. Why were women, during the Soviets, in fact, uh, many um, accepted roles that were defined for women, traditional roles, were forgotten. Women were fighting, 
women were in the battlefield, women were recruiting, in fact, for the Mujahideen. And then we interviewed the Taliban and said, do you, because most of the Taliban today were Mujahideen fighters in the past, and we asked them about women's role. They admitted, they recognized that women did play a very important role to the success of the war against the Soviets. And we said, how about now? They said, we don't need women because we have the public, the populist support. So all of a sudden, that understanding of women's role shifted to a more traditional and not so important role. That's what we discovered in our uh, study. Fascinating. Wow. Um, thank you for that. I'm going to open it up now to the audience, and I'd like it if we could take about three or four questions. Please uh, introduce yourself, stand up, introduce yourself, make your question or comment very succinct and quick, and then we'll wrap it back around for our panel to respond to. So I'm going to just say one, and, and because we have mic runners, I'm going to pick the four right up front. One, two, do we have three and four? Three and four, thank you. All right. Uh, my name is Ann Tickner, and um, I'm a, from American University. Uh, I wanted um, really to just follow on on what uh, Kathleen has said, because I think it's so wonderful that you are indeed uh, celebrating Moon's History Month with talking about women and the roles that they really played, because what I've found in my historical research is actually women are not only forgotten in history, and that's why uh, um, Wendy's um, uh, study is so important. They're not only forgotten, but they're also reconstructed mm -hmm. by history, and I think that that's something that very important that we have to remember. Uh, you mentioned, Wendy, the, the sort of traditional story that's been put out about Germany as these sort of housefrows and women mm -hmm. staying home and so forth. And so not only is their real stories lost, but they're reconstructed in ways that actually uh, deny women agency. Mm -hmm. And that is a very big part of history. And even what's going on today with violent women, very often the way that violence is, is reported is, oh, they did it because their boyfriends asked them to. I mean, if you read things in the press and so forth, there are many stories that uh, we're studying today about what, the way we explain uh, women's violence, women's agency, they still, even though they are operating in these worlds and doing these things, they're still often uh, really denied agency. And I think this is a really important thing about getting the history right and not forgetting it this time. Thank you very much, Anne. Parker? Hi, my name is Parker Reynolds. I'm an LLM candidate at the Washington College of Law, studying human rights and gender. Um, so my question is, post-conflict, do you think discussing gender norms at all during the prosecution of female perpetrators is of any benefit to opening our eyes to this blind spot, or do you think the gender norm should be left out of the courtroom altogether? Interesting. Thank you very much. And then it was very far back, right next to Lauren. Hi, good morning. My name is Marielle Stewart. Um, I just finished up my political appointment at NASA. Um, and my question is particularly for Hamoun. I wanted to know if you could talk a little bit more about the uh, tactics that ISIS uses to um, counter the idea of the Western emancipation in, in terms of their recruitment. Great. And I know there was one more person. Please, I, thank you. All right. Uh, Vicki, right in the middle. Okay. My name is Brooke Tennyson. I'm doing my Master's of Economics at George Mason. Um, my question is more towards Hamoun and Belki. Um, I wanted to know how the groups differentiate between women who are integrated into the state and the state structures versus, excuse me, versus those who are enslaved or excluded or put into more submissive roles. Great. 
right, thank you very much. Uh, I think those are a great uh, beginning. Uh, thank you, Anne, for your, your framing remarks about being forgotten and also reconstructed. Um, I'm actually gonna go to the last two questions first, and then maybe, Wendy, you would take the, the legal question on. Right. Uh, Hamoun, and uh, yeah, Bacchus. sure, uh, thanks for the questions. Uh, uh, but let's start with the last one, um, uh, how to recognize, I mean, to differentiate between the, the women that are in you know, perpetrators and also the victims. Uh, when we have this very strong uh, system of self and othering in, in ISIS, so self would be people who are committed ideologically to ISIS first and foremost, secondly, considered as Sunni Muslims. So anyone out of that circle would be the others and uh, they didn't deserve what they deserve. That's what the, how the things are. So if you look at uh, the victims of, of uh, direct victims, because we have indirect victims too, I'm talking about that, direct victims of ISIS um, in terms of women, they are mostly uh, from uh, racial or religious minorities like the Yazidis or the Shias. Uh, so these are the ones that are targeted first as, as the main thing. So, um, and interestingly, women are in charge. I mean, groups like the police force of, uh, the women police force of ISIS is in charge of uh, arresting these people. These people means that, they, for example, the Yazidi women and, and Shia women, and then uh, through uh, another group that is the um, um, marriage and, and they call it marriage office there. So these are the one taking these women, passing them to the marriage office. The marriage office is in charge of introducing them to jihadi male. So then they would be used as a slaves, they would be used as sexual baits and other things. So that is that is how the thing works. And then we have the other victims, you know, uh, Syrian or, or, or Iraqi Sunni women who are not in line with the, the ideology of the state. They are also considered as others because, not because of the religious point of, the view, point of view, but because of the ideological point of view that they have. They are uh, not being treated as, as slaves, that's Sunni Muslim women, but they are actually being uh, um, uh, arrested, they are being even tortured, but not for those kind of, for issues like, for example, uh, not obeying the dress code, not obeying the, the, the things that the state wants in the public sphere. In the, in the private spheres, it's quite okay, I mean, like anywhere else, but in the public spheres, it is just that, the moral code that is very much concerned about them. And the second question um, uh, about the tactics that uh, IS, ISIS used for, for uh, so as I was saying, you know, the whole, the broad version is that we have emancipation from one side, which is, a, in their opinion, a secular Western um, uh, made up, uh, made by infidels. And on the other hand of the story, we have what we call it, what I call actually, as a, as a divine redemption. So it means that, uh, and, and one thing very, very specific about not only ISIS and many other countries that they call them Islamic countries and are running based on the uh, Islamic regulations and rules, uh, the main thing is the control of women. Women should be controlled. So exactly if you put your step into Islamic Republic of Iran as the only, you know, as one of those uh, fanatic countries when it comes to the matter of women, the only difference that you see from Iran and other Western societies is the way that they control women. Houses are the same cars are the same, buildings are the same, everything is the same. It's just that how women are, how women in public are portrayed. For example, hijab is mandatory there. So the same thing in ISIS we have. Women are, you know, controlling women in public sphere is the time that they can portray themselves as an Islamic society. That is the main thing. And for that, considering women as a source of sin in their ideology, the sexual sin that we are having there, segregating them is the main thing that they are um, having in mind. So by gender segregation, you can have, you can fulfill the requirements of having a proper Islamic society so that the genders are not mixed. And when the genders are not mixed, you are forcing them into these um, gender segregated institutions and you are telling them, all right, if you do your work just for women, uh, if you just fulfill your duty as, uh, and if you, and to, towards other women and towards your husband, then at the same time you have your social movements too. So that would be the way that a woman should be anyway. Thank you, Hamad. Uh, no worries. Okay. Very briefly, thanks for the Sorry. question. The women that we interviewed who expressed support for the so-called jihad, they felt strongly that their religion has been attacked and mm -hmm. they see, they saw that as their religious duty to support their male family members to um, basically defeat the infidels who had invaded the country. But also we asked about, how about uh, government uh, employees who have been attacked by violent extremist groups and so on, and basically the Afghans. And all 
almost all of them said Muslims, no one has the right to kill a Muslim. No Muslim has the right to kill a Muslim. So that was interesting to us that they differentiated between um, infidels and Muslims, how they should be uh, treated in this jihad. Wendy, what do you think about the yeah, question? It's, um, I'm just listening to your comments. It's really um, interesting. It's throwing new, giving me new perspectives on my own, on my own research about how important it is to collect these stories, conduct these oral histories, read these memoirs, um, especially in contemporary cases, engage with the women as much as possible because these are systems mm -hmm. that involve all facets of society and they provide a lot of valuable information. They're not only participating at their agents of it, but they can tell us so much more about why these systems and how, you know, why they, they continue to operate and can, can, can perpetrate this violence. How they come into existence. And I was struck with the question that you posed about the testimony because um, I learned so much going back to many of these interrogation reports. So many of the secretaries and the functionaries and the ex-lovers of these perpetrators were brought in and interrogated. They themselves thought that they would not be prosecuted. They were not, you know, indicted. And they gave so much information. You know, they would say, oh, well, on this day, we were brought, you went brought to the Polish border, and this gentleman came up to us, and they described the uniform. I could then immediately figure out, not immediately, figure out which agency it was, whether it was Army or military, you know, or SS police, so then I could kind of plot that. And he said to us, young ladies, the secretarial pool, we're going to go in, and you're going to go right to work, in, in this case, Ukraine, and don't worry, you're, you know, you may f hear of some bullets, you may hear some shooting, it's just that a few Jews are being shot. And that, that's story story that she remembered really told me a lot about the presence of these women, about their so-called orientation into this crossing over into these, these zones of violence, the official who was there, the time that this was happening, the, the attitude in terms of, no, don't worry, it's just a few Jews are being shot. Um, so these stories that, they, that come out on paper in the courtroom, um, these interrogations are real valuable sources of information um, for us. And of course, it's interesting to, to realize at the time that they felt, you know, they understood their, the gendered um, system, that they weren't being indicted so they could speak freely. Um, um, it was their male counterparts who were, who were under investigation. Um, and the ultimate outcome as well is that in, you know, something like 20,000 perpetrators, male perpetrators, were convicted in East Germany, West Germany, Austria, um, and the, the, you know, 500 women. So many of the women I um, investigated and, and the stories I collected, they, many of them got away with murder. Let's begin again. So I have one and a two, three, and four. Okay, and I'll come back, hopefully. Chantal Jungarte from Women in International Security. I, I don't have so much as a question as a, as a little comment. Uh, and that is, I think we have to be very careful what the implications are when we say women play different roles in violent extremist groups. Uh, because, you know, that it doesn't necessarily mean that they actually have agency, uh, because neither in Nazi Germany nor in the jihadist movement or in Afghanistan, I would argue, a lot of these women have agency. They're actually operating in an environment with structural factors where there's gender inequality. And what is so striking is that Nazi Germany, uh, current rights extremist groups, jihadi groups actually understand these gender roles uh, and know, are very skillful in manipulating these gender roles to continue control over women and to continue, continue gender inequality system. Thank you. Thank that's you, Chantal. That's, that's a very, very important point. Yeah. Thank you. I'm Elizabeth Carroll from the State Department Bureau of Conflict and Stabilization Operations. Um, keeping on that theme of agency, I, I was wondering if, from the historical accounts, uh, we, are there any insights to be gleaned in terms of uh, demobilization, reintegration of, of these women, particularly the fighters or people who didn't have agency before, got this maybe perhaps false sense of, of importance? Um, and then trying to go back to quote unquote normal. Thanks. Thanks very much for that question. Uh, I know you, you, and then Megar. Okay. 
Hi, my name is Kobe Jones. I'm from Women for Women International. Um, and my question is about uh, rehabilitation and post-conflict. Um, so I feel like a lot of aid and development is really focused on women as centerpieces of rehabilitating communities in these post-war conflicts. And I was wondering if there is um, a specific rhetoric or thought process that we need to think about when integrating um, the idea that women aren't only peacemakers in this rehabilitation process. Thank you, Kobe. Great question. Uh, Negar. Hi, I'm Negar with uh, the Baha'is of the United States. Negar, hi. And I had a question um, which actually you've spoken to, but I was wondering if you could maybe as an ending note um, provide sort of your strongest case or articulation of why this matters. I'm wondering when people ask, why does highlighting women's role as perpetrators of violence in this form of agency actually help us in advancing peace? Um, that would be helpful. Okay. Let me take one more question at the very back, sir. Thank you, Ray. It's Cole, U.S. Marine Corps. Um, for the last couple of years, we've been doing research about female insurgents and female terrorists and how they're used um, by different groups. Um, so I had a, a couple questions for all of you, but I'll just I'll just use one. Um, Wendy, in your in your study of the Holocaust and maybe other other Holocausts as well, did you find significant female involvement in Holocaust in, for example, former Yugoslavia, Sudan, or Rwanda? Thank you. Um, let's begin there and, and then work back on sure. the questions, Wendy. Sure. Um, well, two issues that just were raised and are related. Um, it's getting into the, to the, um, the realm of understanding these inherent contradictions in some way, these gray zones, these binaries that start to break down. So yes, indeed, you can have incredibly repressive patriarchal systems of manipulation and power differentials that are very clear. 8,000 women, German, ordinary German women were sterilized, right? Um, because they were communists, because they were considered kind of enemies of the state or degenerate biologically and so forth. And yet there is still room for agency because as I as I understand it, we're not talking about peaceful societies. We're talking about unstable um, states in the making, war, uh, imperialist kind of imperial on the march, um, growing societies. Um, and there's that energy that comes through there in terms of both how they see themselves as historically legitimate in pursuing this um, and in involving everyone because it's got to be a total a total campaign and once you have this kind of uh, uh, motion in momentum. place momentum in place boundary pushing uh, there's it's things societies are in flux there's experimentation that goes on and and certain gender roles start to break down now what happens is when they in the case of, of Nazi Germany um, once the system then collapses and is considered in this case if it's defeated and that was all wrong right and the allies came in and occupied, then in the aftermath of that, oh, going back to normal means that suddenly we have to go back to those ways of, of peaceful gendering and then these reimposition of, of very strong kind of patriarchal systems because, you know, that that all went wrong and um, and women are also, uh, the innocence uh, was, was lost and so forth and, and women become part of that normalization process as well, which suppresses often their actual agency in the crimes. Um, yes, women have been involved. The Rwandan case is probably the most famous, but more work has been done lately on um, Cambodia. Um, and most, most of the story in um, the former Yugoslavia, uh, we do not have uh, a strong case to be made or a strong uh, level of documentation on women as perpetrators, as female agents of violence. I haven't seen a lot of that research because really what that case brought to light, which was very important, was the role of sexual violence in, in, in conjunction with genocide. Um, so it, uh, there's more work to be done potentially there, I don't know, but certainly the case of Rwanda and we know uh, the case of Pauline and, and she was uh, a very active agent officially in the state in the in the Hutu government and she was the one who was inciting uh, uh, men to uh, perpetrate violence including mass rape of women and she was uh, at the ICT um, uh, at the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda and was um, convicted so that's a strong case to be made there um, and we're learning more about if you go back to Armenia the Armenia uh, the the uh, genocide of the Armenians and the roles of Turks um, in that the variegated roles of, of collaborators and Kurds and, and the gendered roles, um, more research is coming out on that. So that's 
um, uh, kind of interesting. The Herrero case is also a very interesting case. German women as missionaries, um, former Namibia, very very much involved in the uh, in the uh, perpetration of violence in the Herrero case. So it's you know taking a case like like the ones we're talking about and then going back historically and, and rethinking, looking at women in the KKK. A lot of good research on that. Women in the uh, genocide of Native Americans in these kinds of vigilante groups on the Western frontier. So, you know, asking these questions um, encourages us to go back and, and revisit historical cases as well. Uh, yeah, um, well, thanks, Chantal, for, for, the, uh, for the comments. Very important, specifically when we are looking at uh, the manipulation of gender roles that we were talking about. When you look at ISIS's um, propaganda, it always puts itself sometimes even in comparison with other jihad organizations, saying, all right, look at them. You are nothing there, but look at us. You are something here. Therefore, you know, that facade is, is something that, you know, attracts many people. Then it is, of course, coming to how real it is and how, how, uh, how false or uh, image it is. Um, in terms in terms of returnees and rehabilitation that we were talking about, unfortunately, if you look at the situation on ground, uh, uh, majority of the attention goes to rehabilitation and, and those returnees from uh, Western societies specifically, but we have a huge number of women that are coming from other Arab nations, uh, which are mostly ignored. I mean, most of what we are talking about is that, all right, the French women, if they go back there, what would happen? What nobody talks about, what about the Saudis? What about the Tunisians, uh, uh, Moroccans? Uh, Algerians, Egyptians, they are there too, and the number of them are way more than the number of uh, Western uh, recruits, recruits. So it is very important to, I mean, when I was in the southern part of uh, Turkey at the border with Syria, you can see quite a number of these uh, um, uh, women coming from other Arab nations that they actually escaped uh, for whatever reason they are now in, 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 in Turkey. But when you talk to the officials, they are saying as soon as one Westerner crossed the border to Turkey, they would be caught and they would be uh, given to, to the embassy of the, the, that uh, respected person. So uh, we don't have any kind of rehabilitation for these kind of women. At the same time, countries like Tunisia are actually forcing their you know, extremists to get away, get out of the country, and they don't allow them to come back. So they just force them to go out. We don't want the problem, so outsourcing problem to somewhere else, which is Syria and Iraq. So they are saying, all right, we are happy that we have the situation in Libya like this, so we can get rid of them. They are actually facilitating. Uh, the fighters, the specific women, to cross the border and go back. So we, do, we are having problem in that sense when it comes to matter of rehabilitation and, and returnees, specifically for these countries. I would like to answer the question about why does it matter. I think it's important that we understand the role that women play in order for them to be included in policy level decision making. What we see, although some countries have included women in uh, decisions about how to counter or prevent violence, including violent extremism, but many countries have not because they still are in denial to understand that women can play both positive and negative role. I think it's important that more and more studies be conducted to understand why do women do what they do when it comes to violent extremism and violence in general. I'm going to ask if the uh, other panelists have any final comments before we close off today. Do you want to go to order? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's just, uh, you know, um, first and foremost, thank you for, for providing this opportunity for us to be here. And um, I guess it was quite interesting to know how um, a combination of um, historical um, study of, of the whole thing and the contemporary things can merge in a way, and how we can learn from history, because I guess that is one of the things that we are missing very much when it comes to the contemporary events. We always look at them as one of a kind suddenly came up, but if you look at that digger, um, I mean, if you dig uh, a bit more uh, on the surface, we can see that no, I mean, we had at least a trend that we can rely on, which has, has, which has happened in past. So um, that can be a very, very good uh, benchmark for us to, to continue the way. I think it's very interesting how you, um, the, is th some of the things that you raised I hadn't really thought about was looking distinctly at the kind of operations, right. the security operations, or um, in your case, um, and the state building operations, and how you know the roles that they're playing in these different endeavors, right. and how they, they cross over or they reaffirm certain um, you know these parallel 
institutions. I thought that was fascinating. And, in, and, and I was really struck by your presentation about um, the various authority figures in Afghanistan, the Taliban, and how women, how is it that women are learning you know, how are the ideas, because of course all of this kind of action is not, they're not automatons, they're doing it because some sort of idea is taking hold, be it religious, secular, uh, utopian, and how, how does that come to them um, uh, and motivate them to get involved in different ways or perform in different roles and rituals? Um, and the one thing though that we didn't get to touch on is the actual perpetration of the violence. And I was, um, uh, one question I had in my own research was, how is it that women actually um, are get a gun, you know, can, can use a gun. I mean, at some point there needs to be a weapon, there needs to be some sort of act of violence, and what is that moment in which um, those women who aren't traditionally trained in, in uniform and military roles, um, you know, think it's okay to, uh, to carry it out? I mean, that's, there's a pretty big difference between kind of working in the system versus actually committing that violence vis-a-vis -vis against men or children or whatever victim group. I would like to say that there is um, a need for further research and studies, as I said before, uh, w about women's participation and contribution in instigating and um, supporting um, violence. Um, there is also um, a need for understanding women's role in promoting extremist views not violent extremists, but extremists that many believe that will eventually lead to violence that needs to be uh, studied. Um, and also for women's groups to put this on their agenda when they work on developing programs to empower women on how to enable them and provide them with the skills and tools to uh, recognize the signs of radicalization, not among boys and men, but also among women, and how to help them de-radicalize or prevent their family members and loved ones mm -hmm. from doing these um, terrible acts. Mm -hmm. Thank you all. I, this brings us to the end of our uh, event here today, and uh, I want to thank uh, our panelists, who I think brought very relevant and, and important ideas to uh, the policy shaping and thinking that goes on here in Washington and abroad. Um, I do want to uh, say that our next event will be on Monday, March 13th, and it is looking at uh, gender equality through investment and gender financing. So we're going to pivot uh, to a very different topic at that point. But I hope you'll take a moment with me and really thank our panelists here today, who I think delivered terrific. Thank you.